All right, hello everyone. Hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So we see people from Nepal, Ukraine, Indonesia, Istanbul, Ecuador, Romania. Oh, someone from the UK as well. Morocco. Yeah. People, someone from Argentina, buenos dias a todos. Mm -hmm. Russia, Poland, Armenia, more Ecuador, Madrid, Slovakia, Slovakia Moldova. Wow, wow we're getting so really, <laughs> We're going global. Uh, yeah, really Peru. Are. So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar about uh, motivation and engagement, beyond motivation, engaging students online and offline. My name is Pablo Toledo and I work as an assessment services manager for Cambridge Assessment English in the Southern Cone and Andes region in South America. With me today is Jamie. Hello, I'm Jamie Milson cook I'm an event coordinator at Cambridge English in our UK office. We're going to start with a reference to a movie and it is an Argentine movie, so this is my Argentine moment, and the movie is El Secreto de Sus Ojos, The Secret in Their Eyes, and it actually won an Oscar for Best Movie. And if you have seen the movie, and if you haven't, this is a recommendation to watch it, it's called El Secreto de Sus Ojos, The Secret in Their Eyes. Um, uh, at one moment, one of the characters is it's they're looking for someone who may have committed a crime they're looking for a suspect and one of the investigators uh in the court has an insight says if you want to look for someone you want to check for their passion what is their passion and they know that this character really loves football so they go and look him up at a football stadium because he's a fan of his team and whatever he does he's going to do he's going to go and watch that team regardless of anything that is his passion so what is my passion i am sharing with you on the pictures two of my passions i am really really passionate about cycling i am not an athlete cyclist not like a road cyclist going on 100 uh, this is me on a uh, this is me on my folding bike and i really love going about but it's pretty much the only means of transport that I use. In lockdown, I haven't actually got on my bicycle since March because I just have to stay at home. Uh, and it's really hurting. And next to that is me on my playing my guitar with, with a group, with, with a band, with a group of friends. Uh, and we play, we're playing Irish music. So if there is anyone from Ireland, a big shout out to you guys. I really love your music. It doesn't really matter that I am not a great cyclist and I am not really worried about the fact that I am definitely a really, really bad guitar player. But it's my passion. It's what I do. It's what I love. Now, in the chat box, can you please think about this for a second and just put there, what is your passion? Do, are you passionate about reading, writing, movies? music maybe you play another instrument maybe it's cooking maybe it's a hobby that you have what is that one thing that you can spend hours and days and days doing what is that thing that you have gone that you start doing at midday that maybe just after just after lunch you start doing it and then you just get into it and you just go and go and go and go. And suddenly you say, why is it so dark? And you realize that suddenly it's night. The whole day has gone by. You, have, you haven't lost your focus. I see people talking about, read, talking about reading, cooking, journaling, dancing, movies, music, again, travel, definitely. No, we're not doing a lot of that, but we would definitely love to go back to that. I see more people with reading and writing, teachers, we go for that kind of thing, it's who we are, painting, dance, I see sketching, cooking. So whatever that thing is, and all of us have one or two or three, just try to capture, try to think about that particular feeling, that feeling that you have when the whole day goes by and you just lose track of time, okay? Just register that emotion because this is what we are going to talk about 
today. Today, I'm going to make a distinction between motivation and engagement. And what is engagement? Engagement is that feeling, that thing that you can't stop doing, that you really love, that absorbs you 100%, that makes you be just there, present in the moment, losing track of time, in the flow, in the zone. So um, hold on to that feeling. And to give us some, what is on the menu? What are we going to talk about today then? Basically three things. Number one, we're going to talk about motivation. And we're going to look at some theory and ideas around motivation, what it is, how it works, what it does. We're going to talk about motivation in general, and then we're going to talk about motivation in language learning. Then we're going to make to take one more step. We're going to talk, we're going to go from the idea of motivation into this idea of engagement. We're going to talk about what it is, we're going to talk about difference with motivation, we're going to talk about why it is important, and then we're going to talk about motivation and engagement in language learning and what things we can do in our classrooms, online classrooms or offline classrooms, to generate that feeling, to give space for that motivation to happen. And I am going to be bringing up a lot of people. I am going to, today, I'm going to have a lot of guests. You're going to see and hear me speaking, just me, but I'm going to bring in a lot of friends because I don't like to be in this alone. And two people that I am definitely going to refer to a lot, and there is a book that goes with it, since a lot of you have put reading as your passion, are... Uh, Zoltan Derny, and if anyone is from Bulgaria, please feel free to, in your minds, correct my awful pronunciation of his name. Zoltan, uh, Zoltan Derny is one of my heroes in teaching. He's definitely a person that I've been reading and following for a really long time. And he writes, he's written an amazing amount of stuff about the psychology of language learning, an incredible production. And uh, he wrote this about motivation. Without sufficient motivation, even individuals with the most remarkable abilities cannot accomplish long-term goals, nor are appropriate curricula and good teaching enough to ensure student achievement on their own. If you are not motivated to learn, if you are not motivating to do anything, then it doesn't matter if you have the best teacher, it doesn't matter if you have the best course book, it doesn't matter if you have the best curriculum, it doesn't matter if you have the best conditions, the best school, the best environment. If you don't want to do it, then there. You can take a horse to the water, but you cannot make it drink. Somehow, that motivation needs to be there. And one thing that we need to bear in mind is Language learning is a long-term goal. It takes a lot of time from the moment you start learning a language to the moment, well, you never finish learning a language. I have been learning English for 30 years or more, and I am still very much learning English. But language learning takes at least six, seven years until you come to the point where you are proficient enough to gain some level of independence, that is a lot of time to sustain an activity. So motivation and sustaining that motivation is absolutely essential. And with Zoltan Derny, I would like to bring up another friend who is, well, not a friend, but another uh, very important name for today, who is Sarah Mercer. And Sarah Mercer took, brings us into the next step, engagement. You can be the most motivated learner in the world. But if something distracts you and you disengage, you're off. If there is no engagement, there is no learning. The challenge is not how do we motivate students, but how do we manage their attention? You love English, you're motivated to learn English, you love your teacher, etc. But in the moment of a class, suddenly... Oh, sorry, I am not engaged, I am not in the class, nothing is happening for me. So 
I am motivated to do this, but if I am not connecting, if I am not engaging, I'm off, that's it, I'm disengaging. And Sarah Mercer talks about this kind of like the economy of attention, like attention is like the currency of education. So in the classroom, what we are doing is we are trying to capture our learners' attention. And we are trying to get that attention into learning and into English, not just during the classroom, but for the whole learning process in and out of a lesson. So getting that kind of engagement, not just interested in, but actively engaged is the secret sauce, is the thing that actually does that. So those are the two big ideas we're going to be discussing in this session. So first, let's talk about motivation. And for motivation, I'm going to bring another friend. And this other friend is a man called Dan Ariely. And he did an experiment using Lego. Don't worry, all of the things that I'm going to say are going to be linked in the handout. So in the handout, which is already available as a, as a PDF on the side at the side of your screens, uh, you will have links, names, and every, all of the things that I'm going to mention are going to be included there with TED Talks and YouTube videos and downloads and loads of things. So don't worry, just go there and everything will be there. So Dan Ariely made an experiment with Lego and he gave two groups of people and he gave people a set of Lego and he asked them to build the to build the monster in this case. In one case, to one group of people, he said, okay, here is the Lego, do the Lego. How much money do you want to do it again? Okay, I just did the Lego, it's kind of fun, but if I am doing it again, it is not so much fun. So I need some motivation to do it. Okay, I'm going to give you money to do it again. How much money do you want? Okay, maybe the first time, just give me one dollar, give me one pound. Okay, you do it again. How much money do you want to do it again? Okay, now I'm getting a bit bored of Lego, but okay, just give me another pound and I'm in. So do it again. And he did it again and again and again until people said, no, no, that's, I'm done, I'm done. I'm not, I don't care how much money you pay me, I'm not doing it again. At that point, he took all of the games, he took all of the models that they produced and he just took them apart. Okay, so here is the Lego, do it. How much money do you want to do it again? Blah, blah, da, 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 da. And then I take them apart in front of you. And then he did it again to the second group. And to the second group, he said, okay, here is the Lego, do it, do the model. And then he said, okay, now I take it apart in front of you. And then I ask you, how much money do you want to do it again? Okay, so what is the difference? For one group, he said, do the model. How much money do you want to do it again? And then when they were finished with all of the models, he took all of these models and took them apart. To the second group, he, he gave them, he said, do the model. Uh, then he said, um, do the, then he said, um, then he took the model apart and then he said, how much money do you want to do it again? Now, what do you think happened? To the first group, which he calls the meaningful condition. He calls it the meaningful condition because you do the model, the model is there and you see all of the models that you have done. That is the meaning the purpose of what you're doing. This group made 11 models. They did 11 mo different, they did it 11 different times before they said, that's it, enough. And then the people who loved playing with Lego, who loved doing the models, built more models than the people who did not. The second group, the, which he calls the Sisyphus condition. Sisyphus, if you remember your mythology, is this Greek character who had done something really awful and he was punished by the gods. 
And what was the punishment of Sisyphus? There was a mountain and Sisyphus had this really heavy rock. He had to push it up the mountain. When he got to the top of the mountain, the rock just fell to the other side. And Sisyphus' job for the rest of eternity is to go down, look for the rock, push it up, then push, then bring it to the top, then see it go down. So there is absolutely no purpose to what Sisyphus is doing. The rock is just going to fall again and again and again. Now, Sisyphus, the people in the Sisyphus group, the people who did the model, then saw the researcher pull the model apart and then were asked. They, ma they made the model seven times, so less times. And the people, and the, they made the same number of models on average, regardless of their feelings for Lego. So they made it less times, but also their, their love of Lego, their love of the activity, stopped being making a difference. Think about that for a moment. How we can, this idea of the meaning, the purpose of what we do has an impact, not just on how driven we are to do something, but the, how our internal drives, how our passion for something, whether it makes a difference or not. You can be interested in learning, but if what you are doing doesn't have a purpose, apparently your interest stops making a difference. That's an idea to consider. Let's look at another example. This time, Dan Ariely gave, gave candidates a word search. You know, the typical thing, the classic game that we do in our classes where you have to find words in a grid. And then he asked people to do it, to do the word search. And then they got one of three different responses from the researcher. And then they asked them, how much money do you want to do this again? So what were the three responses that they got? One was acknowledgement. So do the word search. The researcher took it, said, aha. Put it in a folder. How much money do you want to do it again? Number two, ignored. Simply no response. So. They do the word search, they give it to the researcher, the researcher puts it in a folder, doesn't register, and then says, how much money do you want to do it again? In the third case, absolute rejection. So they do the word search, they give it to the researcher, the researcher puts it in a shredder, destroys the word search in front of their eyes, and then says, how much money do you want to do it? again. So, my question to you is, what do you think is going to be the difference between the different scenarios? There is a poll on the, on the right of your screen. So, do you think people will say, I want more money when my work is accepted? Remember that if you want more money, it means that you are less interested in doing because you say, I, I want a bigger motivation. So I want more money when my work is accepted. I want more money when my work is rejected. I want more money when my work is ignored or it doesn't really make a difference to me. So I see that I want more money when my work is accepted is, is having a very, very clear lead with, but interestingly, it doesn't really make a difference to me is growing. So take a minute, think about that. So do you, are you more or less interested in doing something depending on whether your work is accepted, ignored or rejected? Let's look at the results. The jury is in. And we are going to measure this in terms of how much money they were asking for, what, what Dan Ariely calls the reservation wage. It's not a lot of money, it's just cents. But it's basically, if you want more money to do it, it means that you are less interested. So let's see the results. If your work, if the work was acknowledged, people asked people ask for an average of 15 cents to do it again. So 15 cents. If the work is ignored, 
people were asking for about, let's say, 25 cents. So there is definitely a gap there. What do you think is going to happen in when the work is rejected? Look at that. Yes, they were asking for more money. But were they asking for a lot more money? And here is the challenge. Dan Ariely says that the bad news is that ignoring the performance of people, ignoring it, just not, not reacting, just is almost as bad as shredding their effort in front of their eyes. The good news is that by simply looking at something that somebody has done, scanning it and saying, aha, uh -huh, seems to be quite sufficient to dramatically improve people's motivations. Think about the teaching implications of that. Ignoring something and rejecting something, it doesn't really make a difference. The big difference is between actively acknowledging it, appreciating it, and not appreciating it. So the good news is that adding motivation doesn't seem to be so difficult. The bad news is that eliminating motivations seems to be incredibly easy. And if we don't think about it carefully, we might overdo it. So just think about the teaching implications of that as we move into the next part, because now we're going to go from motivation into engagement. And I and for this time I'm go this time I'm going to bring more friends in and different friends. And for now I'm just going to show you these two faces if you know who you are. And interestingly enough, there were people from Nepal joining us. So the people from Nepal probably will recognize one of these faces. So I'm not saying anything. I'm going to tell you in a minute who these people are. Uh, and then I'm going to, but there is someone that I will tell you right now who it is. And it is my, well, not again, not my friend, but someone who has really influenced my ideas about motivation and engagement, who is Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink is the author of this book that I'm showing you the cover of, which is called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. It was published in 2009. He's not a researcher, he's not an academic, but he just wrote this book bringing together ideas about motivation and engagement and what they are. And it is really an amazing sort of summary of a lot of really, really powerful ideas. So if you're, in, if the, if you're going to read one book about motivation, this could be the book, but there will be a better book that I'm going to tell you about in the next section. Now, and we're going to take two of his ideas. One is motivation 2.0 versus motivation 3.0. And the other is E equals A plus M plus P. And I promise you it has nothing to do with mathematics. So, um, Daniel Pink talks about motivation and he makes a distinction between three different levels three different kinds of motivation, which he calls motivation 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. So what is the difference? Motivation 1.0 is the most basic, is the, to succeed in the struggle for survival, fight or flight. I am really interested in doing this session for you, and you are really interested in what you are watching, but if the building is on fire, you are just going to run away. Uh, all of us are really motivated into leading our lives and doing our jobs and getting a, and going out into the world and traveling and meeting people. But at this particular moment in time, many of those things are really not safe to do. So I have been pretty much at home every day, all day with my family, for the past 90 days. I'm not kidding, 90 days. It's a lot, but it's a safety issue. My life is at risk, other people's lives are at risk. So this is motivation 1.0 and nothing is more important than that. 
If you think your life is in danger, you're going to run away. Nothing else matters. Motivation 2.0 is the classic sticks and carrots. It is if you do something, you get a reward, you get a carrot. If you don't do it, you get, you get punished, you get the stick. So sticks and carrots. That is motivation 2.0. And motivation 3.0 is this friend. And let's see if anybody got it. If you, if you recognize the face, just put it in the chat box because we are talking about George Mallory. George Mallory is the first, was the first, at least the first European person to climb Mount Everest. And he did this in the year 1923. And they asked him, why climb Mount Everest? And his response is just amazing because it's there. So why do you do that? Because it's there. Is there a reason to do it? No. Is there a prize for climbing it? Not really. If you ask a mountain climber, why do you climb that mountain? Is it because they like, climb, they like the activity? Climbing is really painful. It is super dangerous. A lot of people, a lot of people die climbing. And the people who don't die, they get frostbite. They lose fingers. They lose their noses. They, they, they suffer a lot. They have to train their whole lives just to go up those mountains and to be there. And what is the reward? I asked a friend who climbed uh, Mount Aconcagua, the, the highest mountain in the Americas. It's about, it's over 6,000 meters. And I asked him, how long did you spend when you got up there? Because he had been training for years and it took him three weeks to go up. Uh, and then he said, I spent about five minutes there. It's really cold uh, and you, don't, you cannot really spend a lot of time. So all of that work to go up there and spend five minutes, yeah. Why? Because it's there. That is engagement. If you want to know about being driven to do something for no practical reason, Ask a mountain climber, ask my friend, George Mallory. Now, so what is this, this difference between motivation 2.0 and motivation 3.0? Motivation 2.0 is about external rewards and punishment, the stick or the carrot. Motivation 3.0 depends on your intrinsic drive. I want to do that. I have to climb that mountain. I just have to do it or I have to play that guitar. Does it matter that no one wants to hear you play the guitar? No. Does it matter that you're not getting very good at it? No. Does it matter that your fingers hurt? No. Does it matter that you have been playing the same song for days and days and days and you are not getting better? I just have to do it. It's what I love. It's my passion. It is my passion. Motivation 2.0, sticks and carrots, is focused on extrinsic desires. It's focused on something that is outside of you. Why do you want to learn English? Because I want to get a better job. Because I want to go to a university. Because I want to travel. Because, it is, because I want to graduate. And it is a part of my curriculum. That would be a motivation, a stick or carrot approach. If you do well in your courses, you are going to pass and you're going to graduate. And so learn English because you want to graduate. If you don't do well in your courses, you're never going to graduate and you don't want to do that. Motivation 3.0 is the satisfaction of the task versus the value of the reward. Why do you want to learn English? Because I really want to, because it means something to me, because it matters, because it makes a difference to who I am, because it makes a difference to who I want to be, because it is part of me. Motivation 2.0, sticks and carrots, works for routine tasks. If you want to do something that is da, 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 then okay, I tell you, how much money do you want to do that? It's boring, but if you give me enough money, I will do it anyway. And if you give me more money, I will make an effort and do it better. Motivation 3.0, the task is its own reward. 
Was George Mallory getting money to go up Mount Everest? No, he was just going up there. Then motivation 2.0 requires compliance. If, if this is sticks and carrots, then if it is punishment or reward, then what I want you to do is what I is to do this, 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 and that. And I am going to look at how you do that and the compliance to my to my instructions. Motivation 3.0 demands, and here comes the keyword, engagement. Demands that you engage with the idea that you give it your passion, that this activity has all of you engaged in it. And this is where we come to the second phase. And the second phase that I was showing you earlier is another one of my heroes, a man called Seymour Papert. Seymour Papert was one of the founders, is, I think, one of the founders of MIT's Media Lab, a person who is really advanced in terms of looking at teaching, learning, pedagogy, and uh, how to integrate technology into learning. If you know, if you have ever heard about Logo, and if you have ever heard about Scratch, programming languages which are taught, which are used to teach kids how to program, how to use computers, Seymour Papert is the mind, is the main pedagogical mind behind them. And he said this, a teacher heard one child using these words to describe the computer work. It is fun, it is hard, it is logo. I have no doubt that this kid called the work fun because it was hard, rather than in spite of being hard. And this is a key idea in engagement. We keep looking at ways to make our learning fun because we think that fun is motivating and easy is motivating. Or, but actually, when you are engaged, one of the things that engage you is the fact that what you are doing is hard, difficult, that you are putting all of you into it. Think about that and think about the teaching implications of that. We will come back to this idea in a minute, but just hold it in your head for a second. And now let's get in, let's start talking about language learning because so far we have been talking about motivation and engagement in general activities. We've been referring specifically to language learning. Let's look at, let's, let's focus on that for a minute. And now we're going to come back to, we're going to start, we're going to go first into Zoltan Derny. Zoltan Dernier, or, well, I told you I was going to struggle with pronunciation. Uh, and Zoltan Dernier wrote about the psychology of language learning, fascinating work over a period of time. And his, and his latest model on uh, motivation in language learning talks about the motivational self system. It talk, he calls it the theory of the possible selves. What he's saying is that to sustain the motivation of learning a language over a really long period of time, you need to focus, you need to have three ideas or three visions in your head. One is your ideal second language self, your ideal L2 self. What is that? I want to become a person who speaks English. And what does that mean to me? That is the important thing. Maybe to me, a person who speaks English is a person who uses English to communicate with people from other cultures. And that is important to me. Maybe to me, a person who speaks English is a person who uh, is international or who is successful in their work or who uses that language to, to share ideas and their own culture and their own identity with the world. Whatever your motivation is, you need to have in your mind a vision of who you want to be. What am I going to do? Who am I going to be? to become that person. The second thing is the opposite of that, the ought to lang second language self. And that is, 
what I should be and what I should do to avoid not becoming that person. So if I want to be that person that speaks English, who has learned the language, what is it that I need to do? I need to study, I need to focus, I need to read, I need to pay attention, I need to stay engaged. What is it that I have to not do? Well, basically, I don't have to quit. I don't have to uh, not do my homework. I don't have to um, translate or use Google Translate instead of actually writing my essays. Whatever. All so you need to have an idea. So you need to know who you want to be, and then you need a vision of what you need to do, and what you need to not do, to become that person. And then, and this is where your teacher comes in, or this is the most active part. You comes your lang your second language, your language to learning experience. So my learning environment and my experience, my classroom my teacher, the space in my classroom, my classmates? Do I feel safe speaking in that classroom? Do I feel safe making mistakes in that classroom? Do I feel that going there, going to that classroom on Mondays and Wednesdays or connecting to that online lesson is actually something that I want to do that is helping me a space where I feel safe? These three ideas, these three selves work together. These three visions work together. And Zoltan Derny talks about that from the perspective of visions and visualizing those ideas. And he says, where there is a vision, there is a way. And he writes a lot about how to generate that vision and how to foster it. If you're interested in the handouts, there is a link to his website and there are tons of chapters and presentations that he has done on these ideas. So if you want to read more about that, if you want to engage with those ideas, just go to Zoltan's website and look that up or read his book coming up. And his book is the book that he has just published together with Sarah Mercer, the other person I told you about at the beginning of this session. And his book is called, and their book is called Engaging Language Learners in Contemporary Classrooms. It's specifically about language teaching and learning. Uh, and it was published by Cambridge University Press two months ago. So it came out in March, 2020. So uh, all of the things you, all of, all of the ideas that, I, that all of his ideas and Sarah Mercer's ideas that I'm talking about are fully detailed in his book and in a number of uh, webinars, which are also linked to in the handout. So if you're interested in this, Zoltan Derny's website is a good place to start. This book is a great place for a summer. Now, going back to Daniel Pink, Motivation 3.0 is what we are going to call engagement, is definitely engagement. And Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Derny define engagement in very simple terms, active participation and involvement in learning activities. The idea is, so the key words here are active, it's something that you need to do, it's involvement, something that you need to engage with, and then the learning activities because we're talking about learning. But let's give it a little bit more detail. Number one, engagement is about active participation. It's something that you need to do. It is not sitting in your class and listening. Okay. Listening is active, and there are things go happening in your head. Reading is active, and there are things happening in your head, but you need to do it. It is not enough that you sit and watch. And this is very important when we are talking about the online environment, because there is a tendency when we go online to be less active as a learner. It is not going through the motions. It is not about compliance. It is not about do, the, do exercise one, two, three. It is not about being busy. It is not about um, just stay being all the time, just doing an activity, then another exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, listen to this, read that. That doesn't necessarily generate engagement and that doesn't mean that you are engaged just because you are doing things. It has to happen here. It has to happen, sorry, here. And it has an effective, 
cognitive and behavioral components. So I have to care about what I do. My feelings have to be engaged. I have to be thinking and cognitively engaged. So it is an intellectual thing. It is an emotional thing. And it has behavioral things. So something that I feel, it is something that I think about, and it is something that I do. And here it is getting a bit more mathematical because Sarah Mercer and Daniel Pink talk about three different, each of them mentions three components of engagement and they have a little, a small, a tiny difference. So what is the element? What is it that they mention? Sarah Mercer says that for motivation to happen, and this comes from self-determination theory, the first thing that you need is autonomy. The idea, the feeling that you are cap that you can, that you have some degree of autonomy of choice. Then the feeling of mastery, the idea that you feel that you are capable to do what you need, what you need to do. The feeling that I can do this thing. So autonomy means. I am free to make choices about what I do. I am not just sitting and watching a movie. Mastery is I can do this. This is a challenge that I can achieve, but also this is just at my right level of difficulty. If it is too easy, it is not motivating because why do it? I know that I can do that. If it is too difficult, it is not motivating because it's impossible. So why do it? Why try? The right level of difficulty is the idea of mastery and definitely feeling that you can do this. And then relatedness. And relatedness means that you feel connected to what you are doing, that you feel part of your classroom, part of, that you feel an identity with that thing that you are learning, that you feel connected to the idea of what that means. So all of this is under the idea of relatedness, that you are emotionally engaged and that your identity is connected to that thing that you are doing. Daniel Pink says almost the same thing. He says that autonomy is important and he says that mastery is important. But then he talks about a third thing. Instead of relatedness, he talks about purpose. And it is a similar idea, similar but not the same. Purpose is I feel that this thing that I want to do is important, is important to me, is important to the world, that it is going to make a difference, that there is a mission in that. So these two models, I feel that they're in, they, they are interesting because they share autonomy and mastery. So they're coming from the same place. Relatedness and purpose, I feel they are connected ideas, but complementary. And they are really interesting to consider. We think, do we think of engagement? So there is definitely something about having choice in what I do that is important to autonomy, to generating engagement, to feeling engaged. And there is definitely something there about how to manage the mastery side of things. But then some people think about it from the perspective of how connected I feel how engaged in my emotions. Daniel puts it more as how am I connected in the mission sense. Interesting to, to hold these things and to think about, I think it's both. I think relatedness and purpose are kind of definitely connected. And as a complement, they, they, they really say what needs to be said about that, which is why I wanted to present these ideas to you. Now, let's talk about teaching and Let's talk about assessment, because assessment is part of teaching. And here, I'm going to go back to Clara. Uh, I'm going to go back to Sarah Mercer. And Sarah says that engaging teaching is Clara. Clara. Who is Clara? So let's talk about, let's talk about Clara. The C in Clara. So engaging teaching is challenging. First of all, challenging means Goldilocks. If you remember the story of Goldilocks, Goldilocks uh, is 
gets to the bear's house and he sees and she sees three beds. One is too big, one is too small, and the third table and the third bed is just right. And then she sees three bowls of porridge. One bowl is too cold, one bowl is too hot, the third bowl is just right. Goldilocks is this idea of the level of challenge. If an activity is too easy, it is not motivating. If it is too difficult, it's impossible. Why should I try? Goldilocks is the right level of challenge. And two writers, two big, very, very big ELT names who have sort of recently been talking a lot about this idea of challenge in language learning are uh, Dave Noonan and Jim Scriven. And they have been talking in IATF conferences and in a lot of workshops, and they set up a website, which is in the handout. Uh, they've been talking about demand high. And what is demand high? Demand high is their idea that one of the things that happen in communicative language teaching that have been happening is that we are not challenging our learners enough that we are focusing too much on making it fun and easy, and we think that fun and easy are uh, the things that engage, and where actually the things that engage are challenging more, demanding more. It's an interesting idea, uh, and it's an interesting sort of perspective to look at teaching. Are we challenging our students enough or are we just giving them activities that we know they can do because we think that if we push them too much, they will disengage? Actually, if we don't push them enough, they will disengage. Some people are talking, some people are putting in the comments things about I plus one, L plus one. Definitely there is, yes, absolutely, in natural language, uh, in the natural approach, uh, there is something about uh, the idea of the right level of challenge. If you are into Lev Vygotsky and constructivism, this is the zone of proximal development. This idea that you are at this level of competence and that you can develop more if you, that you can do something that is a little bit more difficult than your level, you can do this. And this is actually the opportunity for learning. Now, what is the L in Clara? The L is for learner centered. Something is engaging if it is challenging, something is engaging if it is learner centered. And learner centered means learner choice, and it means learner voice. So choice means you have a choice about what you can do, you feel that you have a choice about where it goes, that your interests are driving the learning, and learner voice is this is the idea that you can actually influence what happens that teacher a very simple way of doing this uh can we read about this subject yeah for next time i will look for a passage that we can read about this topic that you're interested in uh can we do more activities like this or i i we feel as a class that we need to spend more time reviewing this and then we spend and then next class the teacher comes and does that. So the idea that you have a choice and that you can actually influence what happens in your learning is generates engagement. So engaging teaching is challenging, it is learner centered and number three it is active. So the most direct way in which learning can be active is projects, is doing quests, inquiry-based learning. And this is definitely nothing new. I mean, if you think about the pedagogy or the, the ideas in education connected with things like active learning, uh, with project-based learning, etc., they go back to John Dewey. We are not talking about ideas that were developed in the 1990s or in 2000s. We're talking about ideas that John Dewey was writing about in, 1900, in 1910. Okay, so 
there is nothing new, but still it's a new thing. It's interesting that we still haven't quite absorbed that idea that we still consider that new when it is actually a really old in terms of the history of that idea. But anyway, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, quests, anything that actually has your students go out and do things is, and communicative language teaching is all about this, is definitely generates the space for engagement. And then in terms of language teaching, definitely communicative language teaching and the engagement part of that is all about putting language in use. Then the R in Clara is for relevant, for relevant and valuable. So it matters what I am learning matters to who I am. What I am learning matters outside the classroom. And what I am learning gives me a feeling of visible progress. The idea and the reason this is in a different bubble is that in the handout, you will see, among others, a link to a webinar that my colleagues, Donia Estefanos and Sara Ellis did on how visible progress works in language learning and how it generates engagement. If you're interested in this idea, uh, visible progress is about how can we make students see or register the progress that they're making in their language. And finally, the A, is for autonomy rich. Engaging learning gives you, the, generates the feeling of autonomy or opportunities for autonomy. Autonomy over what students do. They can choose what activities or what approaches. Autonomy may be about when they do it. They do it in the classroom, they do it outside of a classroom. And online learning gives you lots of options for math, for managing the when to do something. If you look at approaches like flipped classrooms, if you look at things like MOOCs, or if you're using stuff like Google Classroom, it gives you lots of opportunities. Autonomy can be autonomy over how you do something and who, to, who you do it with. The typical, John does it with Susan, but maybe John doesn't like Susan. Maybe John would rather do it in a group of five, or maybe John would rather work alone or maybe Susan would rather work with Peter instead of John. So that kind of autonomy. Now, Clara is just five very simple, but really general concepts. If you look at Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Derny's book or at the webinars, which are linked in the handout that they delivered on these topics, they go into a lot more detail about each of these points in Clara and what they mean and how they work. But this is just, and I, but I feel that these five powerful ideas are enough to get you started on your journey. Now, I work for Cambridge Assessment English. Where does assessment come into that? Assessment, the right kind of assessment used at the right time. And friends, if you're watching this, you're you, you probably know that in, the, in our YouTube channel for Cambridge Assessment English, we have a lot of webinars that we have been doing over the years. If you want to know more about the options for assessment and how assessment fits into teaching and all that, there are lots of webinars that we have done over time. So please go into them. But I will just mention a few ideas just to wrap up, to, to give it, to, to incorporate assessment because we've been talking a lot about teaching and learning. We haven't said anything about assessment. So, number one, uh, assessment, if you, if you do it in steps, if you set goals and you assess goals, milestones, assessment can, gives you, can give you the Goldilocks effect. So, if we are in a course that is going to take you from knowing no English to knowing a lot of English in the course of six, five, six, seven years, however much, at the end of year one, you need some kind of milestone and you need a challenge, which can be your A1 exam or your A2 exam or your B1 exam. That gives you the right level of challenge. If you have a B1 learner, if you have an A2 learner and you say, okay, now you're going to sit for your A2 exam, that is just right. If you say you're going to sit for a B2 exam, too difficult. There, a good assessment tool gives you clear, 
works with clear standards and gives you clear steps to go from one step to the other. That fosters the feeling of, that generates the idea of mastery, I can do this, but also the idea of purpose. I want to continue studying so I reach that next step. If the language that is in your test or in your assessment uses real language and uses real language needs and real language skills and competencies, if you feel that in the, the test is not just looking at 20 synonyms for one word, but actually asking you to engage with language in ways which are real and use the real world, that gives you a sense of mastery and purpose as well. If the assessment tool that you are using has recognition and valid and you can use it to travel, you can use it for your to get a job, you can use it uh, to study at university. That gives you a sense of purpose, kind of instrumental motivation. And also, if the results that you get are going to validate, are going to tell you that you've done well, are going to give you sort of ideas as to the things that, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, how can you get better? And those things are going to give you a sense of achievement, definitely, and the autonomy to focus on your weaknesses and to celebrate your strengths. These are just some ways in which um, assessment can be m motivating or engaging too. Now, where to go from here? Because we are almost at the end of a session. So here are some webinar recordings that you can explore. All of these are in your handout, so don't worry. Um, then if you want tools to use in your classrooms. Uh, we at Cambridge English have put together this supporting teachers website during the current lockdown situation and online teaching being here for all of us. All of the resources that we create, all of the resources that we have put together and more of them are coming out every day and all of the resources from Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment International English are to, are on this page and through this page you can have access to them. Then uh, teaching resources, materials for exam preparation, blogs, webinars like this one, uh, access to tools like Write and Improve, uh, support packs, all kinds of things, including this teacher support pack which has basically everything that you need in one interactive uh, document, electronic document, with links to absolutely everything. So if you're looking for tools that you can use to make Clara happen, everything you need is right here. So Jamie, perhaps this would be a good time to go to some of the questions that have been coming up in yeah. the chat box. Yeah, right. Well, everyone's been saying it's been a fantastic webinar. So thank you, Pablo, for that. It's been really good. Lots of lots of engagement. A lot really around uh, sort of Daniel Pink's book, really. Um, so one question was, uh, does visible progress matter in motivation Absolutely. Visible, uh, visible progress matters a lot. And actually, it matters more for motivation 3.0 than motivation 2.0. Because actually, if we are talking about sticks and carrots, punishment and reward, what the only thing that matters is, teacher, do I get the stick or do I get the carrot? But it doesn't really matter how much learning I have done. Visible progress, the idea that is the idea that I am not focused on my stick or carrot. I am focusing what I have actually learned. And that is what generates the engagement. Mm -hmm. Sort of the idea that I am not focused on, is the teacher going to give me a good grade or a bad grade? Am I going to pass or fail? Uh, is the idea that I can see the, the progress that I have made and that progress is the reward. So the reward in Motivation 3.0 mm -hmm. is in what you do, not in what you get from what you do. Um, and then again, again, something again relating to uh, Motivation 3.0, is it social or purely internal? And that is a great question is and it is both. Uh, this is where relatedness and purpose come in. That is the social and how related you feel to something and where you see the purpose of what you do is deeply personal and has to do with who you are, but it is also social. Um, so 
it matters to me and okay. I want to do it and I am and I am interested in that as myself I like it it gives me pleasure it's going to be useful it's going to make me move forward in life but it is also going to have an impact to the people around me to the place where I live to all of it they don't they go together actually uh, usually an individual drive goes together with a social sort of an individual reason goes together with a social reason so they kind of they it comes sort of and you need to foster both as a teacher in the classroom to generate a space where there is like a collective like a group engagement and sort of uh, and that is re a really important thing for teachers to, 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 to work on so it's both actually Brilliant, brilliant. And so it's just one more quick question, I think. Just got time for one more. Um, in schools, a lot of students aren't motivated to learn English. What can we do to engage them? So it's probably quite a, a lengthy one to talk about now, but um, I think you've, you've covered it quite well in this. I think it's really... Mm. I'm going to going. just... An interesting thing here is uh, there is something that Sarah Mercer says in one of the webinars that are linked in the handout, which is uh, which she did for Cambridge University Press, Cambridge at Home Experience. Uh, uh, and she says, "You can take." There is this saying: "You can take a horse to the water, but you cannot make a drink." Like you can bring a student into the classroom, but you cannot really make them engage. They just because they're sitting there doesn't mean that uh, they're actually engaged with what they're doing. What she says, and this is where, and this is the answer to the, my sort of short answer to the question: is you can take a horse to the water, you cannot make a drink but you can make it thirsty. The idea of Clara is that if you present your, your learners with something that is Clara, you are giving them, you are create sort of, you are giving them all the ingredients to engage. If you make the activity about do exercise one and get all the answers right or you fail, you are not giving them a space where they can engage. It is not something that is engaging in nature. It's very difficult to engage with punishment and reward. But you are creating a space if you generate that. And this is where the role of the teacher comes in. Again, I mentioned Vygotsky earlier. One of the powerful ideas in uh, developmental psychology, in Piaget, in Vygotsky, is that the, the role of the teacher is to be the adult, the, the, the adult figure that the more experienced figure in the learning process and the relationship between the learner and this more experienced figure is actually a big driver in the learning and the engagement so mm -hmm. if you are there as an example that is definitely going to generate the engagement and your role the teacher's role here is absolutely crucial this is where we teachers can really make a difference wow that was really great oh, that's Thank you for such an amazing webinar. Um, there's a couple of people just commenting about uh, downloading the certificate. Um, if you're having trouble, don't worry, it's again will be sent out to you. And it's an editable, editable PDF, so you can enter your own name into it. Um, but I think that's all we've got time for. Pablo, thank you so much, as always. I'm getting up early, as per usual, with us. So thank you so much for giving up your time and for a really fantastic and engaging webinar. Thank you, Jamie, and to everyone who joined, thank you so much for yep. giving us the time for being with us today. Feel free to go on YouTube a few days from now and just re-watch. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining yes. us. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.